Good evening, everybody. Okay, tonight is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Pringle, a distinguished professor of botany at the University of Wisconsin. She tells us all about the physics of spore dispersal, a subject that will no doubt exceed any and all expectations in Ann's very capable hands. As program chair, one of my duties is to introduce our guest speakers each month, but in reality, I'm meeting most of the speakers at the same time you are while I'm introducing them. And that happens to be the case again tonight. I have, however, known of Dr. Pringle for perhaps seven or eight years when I, quite by accident, came across an article in the New York Times about our lecturer, who at the time was teaching at Harvard and studying the seemingly immortal lives of lichens in, New England, in a New England graveyard. Absolutely captivating article and subject matter. And earlier this year, as I was compiling a list of all the guest lecturers I'd like to hear from before my time as program chair ends in December, I remembered that article and I thought, I'd really like to invite that lady who studies lichens in a New England graveyard to come speak with us. Here we are. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Ann Pringle. Mm. <laughs> thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for the, that was the, boy, that John Cage talk and, and seeing your collections, um, A, makes me want to learn a lot more about John Cage and also reminds me that I should be getting out into the field <laughs> quite a bit more than I am certainly getting out right now. Um, all right, let me start by sharing my screen. I also want to give a shout out. There are two people here um, today um, who I know. Uh, one, John Harper, um, who is a fellow board member with me of Mushroom Observer, the kind of little engine that could. And I also one of my former students is here, Sasha Mushigian. Um, she was an undergrad in my lab, and so I just want to give a, I want to say hi to John and to Sasha as well. So I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm. Um, in Madison, and here we occupy ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this land. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. And today we respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. And some other time, if you want to invite me back, I'm involved with a project that's talking a lot about the decolonization of names of fungi, because of course, as you all will know, a lot of what we're working with now are, are European um, names of, of uh, endemic fungi that actually don't have, you know, don't have, um, don't have our own names, our shared names. All right, so I'm going to talk about the physics of spore dispersal. I want, I promised you I would talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. But as I was putting together this talk, I realized that it would be a lot more meaningful if I could talk to you first about why I even care about spore dispersal and the physics of spore dispersal, because it's a, you could argue it's a fairly arcane um, subject. So the I want to I want to reach that problem of um, how spores move around by first talking to you about the problem of invasive mycorrhizal fungi. And actually, when I gave a talk to your club 15 years ago, this is uh, what I was talking about. The research was at a different stage, and it's pretty funny because that that talk, what I remember vividly, is my daughter, who at the time she's now in college, but she was seven years old, and she spent the whole time hiding behind the podium. Um, that I was giving the lecture at, and then she popped out at the end, <laughs> which was kind of funny. All right, so let's let's start by talking about what mycorrhizal fungi are. And mycorrhizal fungi have been much in the news, um, much in the news, much in the movies. If you've seen the movie Fantastic Fungi, a lot of the conversation was about mycorrhizal fungi. If you've read the book Overstory, you've been reading about mycorrhizal fungi. Um, but the base baseline data, I would argue, for, for why we care and, and care so passionately and talk about mycorrhizal fungi is this um, experiment that I call the big plant, little plant experiment. And this is a kind of experiment where plants are grown with and without mycorrhizal fungi and with different species of mycorrhizal fungi. And what you find is that the plants growing with the mycorrhizal fungi are bigger than the plants without mycorrhizal fungi. And this experiment, you're looking at me in the corner of this image. This is my experiment from my PhD dissertation. But this experiment has been done by 
I'm going to argue thousands of different researchers. It's been replicated in all kinds of environments. And um, basically, the result is, is typically that the controls here, you're looking at uh, of a plant called Englishman's foot, actually, Plantago lanceolata. Um, and, you know, the control don't plants don't have mycorrhizal fungi, and they look very different from the plants that do have mycorrhizal fungi. So although these results are highly context dependent, so for example, sometimes mycorrhizal fungi don't provide a benefit to the plant, for example, often in low light conditions. In general, I think that, you know, we can say that in nature, plants need mycorrhizal fungi and mycorrhizal fungi need plants. Um, so this is the same experiment with oaks. You on the on the on I don't know. I think for you it's the right hand side. You're seeing oaks growing with truffle fungi, and on the left you see not really very many oaks, and they're not growing very well because they don't have the fungi. So this is the same big plant, little plant experiment. Um, again, showing that mycorrhizal fungi have dramatic impacts on the growth of plants and plants that we care about. And there are two kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, and they are very different from each other, and they associate with very different kinds of plants. And this is something that I'm going to return to again at the very end of the talk. There are endomycorrhizal fungi that grow inside the roots of plants, and those are things that, for example, would grow with your tomatoes. And then there are ectomycorrhizal fungi that grow outside the roots of plants, and those would, for example, grow with oak trees. So these ecologically have similar functions, I might argue, but they're radically different in terms of all other kinds of biology that you might think about. Different kinds of fungi, potentially different kinds of resources exchanged, and it's really important to understand that when you talk about mycorrhizal fungi, there are these really distinct groups of mycorrhizal fungi. The inside or endo ones and the outside or the ecto ones. All right. So now we get to the to this part of the story that's about invasive fungi. So you may not know, but actually pines are not native to the southern hemisphere, which is kind of a crazy, um, a crazy thing to learn if you if you didn't know that before. There are no pines native to places like New Zealand or South Africa, but they're planted there. And so here uh, is a snapshot I took outside driving in a car um, out, you know, through the windshield of the car. I wasn't driving. Um, and you see this really peculiar feature on the landscape, and you see this all over places like New Zealand and South Africa, actually. Um, and this very peculiar fe feature is pines being planted in New Zealand where they are not native as a crop. And it's called a plantation. That's the name for this kind of um, forestry. And it's, it's a crop. It's pines as a crop, okay? Um, and they're harvested and they're turned into things that we need, um, like toilet paper, which certainly was a subject of a, a lot of discussion over, over the last year. So why, you, if you want to know why, I mean, why would someone plant a pine tree in New Zealand? The answer is very simple. Um, they're rapid. They're rapidly growing. They're, they're a good crop species, just like wheat, right? So you're planting pines just like you would plant wheat, except you're not eating the pines. You're, you're turning them into toilet paper and, and paper goods and all, all kinds of things. All right, so, so what does this have to do with fungi that pines are planted? Well, it turns out that when pines were first, um, when foresters were first experimenting with trying to grow things like pines in the Southern hemisphere, the pines did not grow. The crops failed and foresters figured out that the reason that the crops were failing is because the, the plants didn't have the fungi. And this was actually some of the earliest evidence for this association called a mycorrhizal association, which is a fairly recent discovery, I would argue. And so Forrester started, started to wonder, well, maybe you could, you could bring these fungi to, to the pines by mailing soil. And this is a long time ago, right? So there were not the restrictions that there are now on moving soil between countries. And so a guy named Mikola was paid by the United Nations, by the Food and Agriculture Organization, to talk to foresters. And he would talk to foresters and he would learn things like, he would talk to a forester in South Africa and the, 
South African forester would say, yeah, I, I, you know, talked with a friend or probably wrote a letter to a friend in the Netherlands. And that guy in the Netherlands sent me a tin of soil from such and such a place. I put that living soil at the base of my pine seedlings and now they grew where they didn't before. So something had been activated. I mean, he was adding mycorrhizal fungi. And then that forester would take some of the soil from the successful pine plantations and mail that soil, you know, for example, um, to East Africa. And then um, Nicola would talk to other foresters and the foresters would say, oh yeah, I shipped it here, I shipped it there. So there's this really interesting oral history, this record of how foresters move soil around very deliberately, very specifically to move the fungi around to enable mycorrhizal associations, although how much any individual forester could have told you about what exactly was happening is not clear, but that's what was happening. Um, so soils were moved around. And so, so fungi were introduced all across the world. And one of the things that I think is really profound about studying fungi, and I don't understand it, is that in the, in the way that we think about conservation biology or invasion biology right now, certainly in this country, we when we think about invasion and conservation, we think about plants, garlic mustard. I'm going to guess at least half of you in this audience have volunteered to pull garlic mustard before. You think about animals and you think about pathogens. You think about um, Dutch elm disease potentially. But there's this, you know it, that you collect this whole world of biodiversity that somehow isn't a part of the conversation. And that's really my conversation, right? I want to talk to you about the alnicolas and the anosomies and the lacarias that have been moved around the world um, and are introduced species, not always in the context of forestry, by the way, um, but often in the context of forestry. So these are all the different genera of fungi um, that we've recorded through various kinds of research that have been introduced uh, around the world. And so here are, is a map of the world and the green circles are proportionate to how many um, species of fungi that are not pathogens, they're ectomycro, in this case, they're ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of, there are a lot of introduced species, not surprisingly, given the story I've told you about forestry and pines, a lot of the introductions are concentrated in the global south. So countries like Australia, for example, um, or South Africa have a lot of introductions recorded. Um, so then again, not surprisingly, some of these introductions become invasive species. And the last time I was talking with you, I was talking with you about the death cap, which is this deadly poisonous fungus that gets a lot of attention that is absolutely invasive on the west coast of North America. It's found on the east coast of North America, um, including the record from DC that William Needham talked about but it doesn't seem to be invasive on the East Coast, which is also really interesting. Um, it seems to be restricted in its in its habitats on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, it is not. And it's abundant and spreading. And um, I noticed, by the way, in the article that someone sent me in the chat that there's a definition of an invasive species that's not native and causing harm. Um, and there are uh, quite a few definitions of invasive species that that people use. And I would say that I don't I like that article. I don't have evidence that Philodes is causing harm. So if you didn't want to use the word invasive species, um, I would have a conversation, you know, I'd, I'd hear you out. But to me, um, the element of harm is a complicated one. We could talk about that. And it's complicated for reasons the article identifies. Sometimes it's really difficult, especially with, with this kind of a fungus and to prove that it's causing harm. One might even argue it's providing a benefit it's a mycorrhizal fungus. But then we get back to a very complicated conversation about whether mycorrhizal fungi always provide benefits. Anyway, that's a conversation maybe for a different story um, for a different time. So, so here's the death cap, but I also wanna say that it's not the only invasive species on invasive ectomycorrhizal fungus on planet Earth. It's just that no one studies them. So here's another story. Now I'm taking you to a totally different part of the world, Colombia and South America, where I've been doing a lot of work. And we're high in the Andes Mountains now. Um, we are at the southernmost distribution of the genus oak. You're looking at an oak species that's endemic to Colombia, Quercus humboldtii. And these are native forests. 
Um, and when you go to these high elevation oak forests, you find a European Amanita muscaria. It's the most startling thing you've ever seen. Um, the locals call them hamburguesas because they look like hamburgers, which is true, they kind of do. Um, and here you're looking in green at sites where my collaborator Natalia Vargas has documented the presence of Amanita muscaria and blue is like the holy grail of invasion biology. Um, because here, perhaps for the first time, we're documenting that this fungus is associating not just with planted pines, which, it, which is what the green is, is telling you, um, but also with, um, with this native Quercus Humboldtii. And here's what it looks like on the ground. This is the road going through the um, going through the mountains um, in in yellow and in sorry I have to move uh, lots of things on my screen around um, in yellow and in purple. You can see this Amanita muscaria with Pinus patula, which is a Mexican species, um, and acacia, which is I'm not sure where this acacia is from, but here then is where the muscaria is with is with the Quercus Humboldtii. So this is a really compelling graphic to me because you're really, you're literally watching this fungus move across the landscape. So so this is it, right? So I'm interested in, in these invasive species. I'm interested in what's happening. I'm interested, I feel like we're taking the earth like a giant snow globe. We're shaking it. All the snow, which is all the species is moving. They're all moving around, we're doing it. And then they're all settling back down. And it's an interesting question it's also just interesting conceptually and intellectually, how are the species gonna sort across the globe? But then of course it has all other, it has a whole lot of other kinds of in, in, you know, um, implications for biodiversity that we care about. So that, that's what I'm really interested in. And that's how we get to how spores move. But it turns out that how spores, because spores, that's right, that's it, right? That's that's what we think. That's how a fungus moves across a landscape. It shoots spores. Somehow the muscaria in from these purple dots has shot spores across the landscape um, and moved around um, through its spores. Oh, I and before I go on, I just want to acknowledge this is Natalia Vargas. Um, who's a Colombian scientist and the lead on this work that I'm showing you. And here we are in the field. And I promise you that these Amanita muscaria were not photoshopped in. Although part of the reason I love this photograph is it absolutely looks looks like I took little Amanita muscaria out of a fairy book or something and just plopped them in the picture to, con to convince you. But I promise you it's not, the photograph is not altered in any way. Um, anyway, there we are collecting. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot I stuck the slide in at the last minute. Here are just um, numbers on on fungal introductions. Um, and you can see, you know, for example, you can focus on the Amanita or you could focus on fungi generally. And this line shows you uh, in hectares amounts of planted forest. And these are different countries. And Natalia compiled these data and uh, they're just uh, there to me that it's quite compelling evidence that humans are associated with with moving these fungi around right we plant the forests um, we bring the soils and uh, and that's what brings fungal introductions and you know invasive species at least two that that we know about for these ectomycorrhizal all right so spores so what do we know about the movement of spores well um this is sort of the state of the art. The migration of birds and mammals in search of new sites and sources of food occurs in an orderly coordinated way with minimum wastage of progenies. Plant pathogens, or just insert the word fungi there. Fungi, on the other hand, produce enormous numbers of spores that are passively transported, scattered in all directions, and finally land on non-target sites in uncongenial environments as well as on congenial hosts. Um, well, Okay, so when I started reading about this, you can see the states in 1990, I, my reaction was sort of like, well, okay, is that all we can know? That they just produce, you know, billions of spores and the billions of spores go everywhere and it's completely stochastic and um, absolutely, you know, un, you know, uncontrolled and gosh, it just, you know, we just don't really can't, that's it, that's the, that, and so I was, as you could tell, I was really startled. So I started to look into spore dispersal and it turns out, 
maybe not surprisingly, I'm not sure, that there's basically, I can count on one hand, the number of scientists who have studied spore dispersal. And it starts with Buller in the 1930s, and some of you may have heard that name before, um, and his self-published researches on fungi. And it basically goes, um, two people, like a guy named Olive, um, to um, uh, Webster, um, Nick Money studied this, um, but it, 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 essentially there's not a lot. And so you, if you study spore dispersal, you end up reading a lot of papers from the 1930s and the 1950s. And uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Um, so, so that was sort of where the world was when I, um, when I started, when became interested in this. And the work that I'm about to show you is an enormously cooperative endeavor that pulled in engineers and applied mathematicians and physicists, as well as myself, I'm clearly the biologist in the group. Um, but we really started to explore this idea of passive transport of fungi. So now I'm gonna tell you two stories. They both have the same message, but they're the first is the story is almost the first story I ever told about, almost the first story I ever told about spore dispersal. And the second story is almost the latest story that I've ever told about spore dispersal. Um, and they're both, again, about this idea of movement and, and how spores move across the landscape and this idea of and challenging this idea of just passive stochastic dispersal. And here you're looking at a spore print of an amanita um, with its, you know, millions of spores passively transported in any direction, apparently. All right. So now here's the first story. And it's about uh, this is about a pathogen, actually. Um, now I'm just interested in spore dispersal generally. You're watching puffing. And maybe this is something that some of you have seen in the field because this is not just a cute hat trick of this one plant pathogen, lots and lots of species puff. And this isn't the kind of puffing of a puff ball. Um, this is, if you're looking at the base of this Petri dish, there's actually, why not play it again? Um, there's a, there's a, um, a, a sclerotia that's formed a, a sporocarp. Um, and the if this is an ascomycete and the and the sporocarp is releasing spores and creating a puff and if you've seen like the orange peel fungus um, in nature you might have seen this kind of puffing before um, there's there's lots of different kinds of ascomycetes um, disc fungi that that you would have seen doing this kind of puffing actually I'm going to pause because I realize I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk for and I can like talk and I'm not going to go over time. So yeah, we're, we're, we try and end at like 8.50 and try and wrap it up at nine with questions for 10 minutes of questions. That's about, okay. but whatever you want to do, Anne. Okay, fine. I'll end at my 7.40, your 8.40 to leave plenty of time for questions um, or before then. All right, so this is puffing. So this is a really intriguing behavior and it's intrigued people for centuries actually. Um, so you can actually find an illustration of puffing um, from 1729, this is a copy of this 1729 illustration of puffing that was copied by, by Arthur Henry Reginald Buller um, in one of his books. Here's a beautiful print by a guy named Bouillard of puffing. Here's the orange peel fungus puffing. Lots of people have noticed puffing and been intrigued by it. And it's, it's really fun if you're teaching a lab and you can find a fungus at the right time and you bring it into the lab, you can make it puff for your students and they love it it's so fun to watch. I mean, who's not going to love it? And there has been some work, including by Buller, um, thinking about why puffing, right? This is a very different way of moving your spores in the air. It's sort of an intriguing behavior, if you want to use the word behavior. And so the question here is, why puffing? What's it all about? And here is a paper from 1976. I'm telling you, I live in the old literature. And, and these two people, Hart Hill and Underhill, noted that when you got a fungus to puff in completely in completely still air, that those um, that the release of those spores formed a jet. So formed this column of spores, forced the air. They're they're moving in the air. They're they're um, there's a lot of movement. Sorry, my hands are a lot of move. There's a lot of movement associated with these with the ejection of these spores. And Buller, in his writings, also noted that this, this has something to do with projectiles being discharged from the assi, which are the, the spore-bearing structures inside an ascomycete, bombarding the air and, and set it in motion. 
Um, and basically, long story short, it turns out that the that that what's going on here is that there's a cooperative behavior. So these spores that are being that are being ejected out of this um, single sporocarp, this single fruiting body, are in fact they're setting the air in motion. They're they're creating a a jet of air. And think about it this way: the first spores that go sort of move the air a little bit, and then the ones that come behind are not only moving the air, but they're 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 moving in the wind that's created by the first spores. So these are fungi that are creating their own wind um, to move spores places. So the first spores move there a little bit. The ones that come behind move the air and also are drafting in the air that's been moved by the first spores. Anyone who's a bicycle rider, if you bicycle if you go bicycle riding in a pack. If you're the first bicycle rider, you're breaking the air, right? But if the bicycle, if you want to be really fast, you want to be at the end of the peloton, right? Um, because the bicycle riders at the end of the peloton are drafting in the wind that's set in motion in the air currents that are being created by the first bicycle riders. It's exactly the same phenomenon. So these are these fungi are creating their own wind, which I'm going to note is not doesn't sound very passive to me. Um, to create your own wind. So here's another way of looking at it. A spore that goes um, all by itself, sorry, I'm moving people around on my screen as I look at the PowerPoint. Um, a, a spore that goes by itself will only go so far, right? Look at the blue. But, a, 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 but spores that are being released as part of this cooperative pack get much further in, in the jet. Um, so it's a cooperative behavior and the point is to move spores further than they would go otherwise. All right. So at the time we were doing this work, we created this movie and it's just a different way of saying the same information. And I think it's fun. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to show you the movie and, um, you have to get to the movie and none of us are at any of these places anymore, but this is where we were when we made the movie. Um, and we entered it into a competition that we did not win. Um, but here is the movie. There's no sound. But I'm not going to talk too much over it because I feel like that's distracting. And these are all my co-authors. This is the problem of a single spore doesn't get very far because friction slows it down and it stops. This is a really important point. Not only do the spores travel further, they can move around obstacles by cooperatively puffing, releasing at the same time. And here you can see the little spore carps better. I so Vortical just means that when you see a, a line or a plane, all of those spores are moving at the same speed. And so here's just a model of how, how the spores are moving. Again, just simulating speed, trying to understand how, how this puffing works. Okay, here I am going to pause it and back up because so if this is a cooperative behavior and any cooperative interaction, you, you have to ask how is cooperation enforced? 
if it, if in this cooperative behavior it's best to go last, which it is, it's best to go last. The spore that goes last should go the furthest. How is that? How how come spores don't evolve to always go last? And this video suggests at least part of the solution, at least for some species. If you notice, and this is just an escobolus growing out of rabbit dung, um, when it's when this then the black specks are the spores. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny little fungus that you're just looking at an enormous image of, but it's a tiny, tiny little fungus. So the black specks are the spores and watch how they go. Okay, so they start at a point and then they eject an ever widening circle. So it's not random. I mean, you could think about the spores shooting all over the place, one after the other, all over the surface. That's not what's going on. Instead, see, the now the, the there's a patch that's clear of all the spores in sort of like the middle right of this of this spore carp. Um, and and the spores eject in ever widening circles. And that's actually, it turns out, a mechanism to enforce cooperation because if you eject, um, I'm gonna pause it, if you eject, if you eject early, you're not in the wind. If you eject late, the wind has passed you by. The wind is strongest, if you want to think about it this way, right where the spores are ejecting in these ever widening circles. So you want to go right when that circle hits you. Um, you want to be in the stream, not, not out of the stream. And so this, in one place you have a moving jet and the other you don't. And it, and it, and um, again, just trying to understand what happens if you shoot outside, outside of the, outside of the wind as it's approaching you and moving across the surface. All right, I'm gonna stop that and go back to my, um, I'm gonna just check the chat for a minute to see Oh, the color, sorry, Amy, the, the colors um, are about, about how fast you're going. Uh, Jerome, I'm, I'm going to answer that question later. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to head back to the, to the PowerPoint. Which of course means I have to find the PowerPoint and the 20 kajillion things I have open. Oh, here we go. All right. Okay. So, um, so the second, so that's the first story, and this was published in 2010, so quite a long time ago now. Um, and here, what you're looking at are on the. This is just to say that this is on the left. You're looking at our models, and you've seen those images by now a few times. On the right, you're looking at an image of an actual puffing event. Um, but what we did is we shot a laser through the puffing event. First, we took the laser and we flattened it to be a thin sheet of light instead of just like a single point of light. And then we shot that sheet through the puffing event so that we could image individual spores and track their velocity. And this was just so that we could compare, um, for example, if you look at the bottom, the velocity profiles of our theory to the velocity profiles that are actually recorded from a puffing event. Um, and all of this is a way to say that it's a highly collaborative endeavor, but um, that the modeling works pretty well. As you can see, the velocity profile um, has this uh, decay signal that you can also see in the in the real data. And this was too fast for us to capture. All of these things are happening very quickly. Um, we're often, in this case, we're often using high speed cameras and slowing things down, et cetera, to try to get a to to, to try to capture the image. Um, but this is puffing. Um, and again, it just is not a very, it's just not a very passive event. Um, all right, so now that's the first story about cooperative puffing. And also I just wanna emphasize again that this is not a cute hat trick of one species. This is, this is something that a lot of fungi do. They release their spores all at once in a puff to move, to create their own wind and to get their spores places. All right, so the next story I'm gonna tell is very different. Um, 
but it has a similar theme challenging this idea of, of passive nature. And for this, I'm actually going to switch to a different PowerPoint presentation. I apologize for moving around. Um, but this PowerPoint presentation comes from a keynote that's a lot harder to move. And hang on, because I'm having trouble finding it. I apologize. Oh, right, because I have to end the show. Okay, here it is. All right, so um, this work is done, um, was led, now you're looking at the puffing event, um, just by way of introduction again. On the left, you're gonna see the spore move. Um, that's from an unsuccessful experiment where we tried to slow down an ask, ASCO spore is being shot out of a ASCUS, and that is being filmed in a glycerol solution. And even though we filmed it with a high-speed camera with a glycerol solution, we still couldn't capture um, that we couldn't capture the motion well enough to say anything about it. So that's an unpublished video, but it's kind of fun. So I just want to give a shout out to Agnese Seminara, uh, my collaborator and the lead on this work, who's a physicist at the in Nice in France, which um, is kind of a fun place to go visit. And that's that's Agnese and her and her daughter as of a, a month ago. Okay, so this story starts with an observation that we made a long time ago and has had frust and frustrated us for a long time. And again, I'm telling you, I live in the old literature. This is a really old observation. And it's been made by all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And the observation goes like this. Many species of fungi release their spores at the same time every day. It's not random. It's not stochastic. So for example, um, here, here is a fungus um, that seems to be releasing its spores in the middle of the day every day at noon why and what what's that all about so like puffing it's an old observation that that people haven't really known you know what to do about um and so here are a, a different paper but um again showing you for very common species like alternaria and cladosporium again these are not this is not a cute hat trick of a single species that's obscure. This is something that uh, a lot of different kinds of fungi do. Um, and here you're looking at these, yeah, these alternaria and these cladosporium and they're, and they're, they're shooting at midday. Okay, so what's that all about? Um, why? So we thought somehow that this must have to do, so a fungus that releases a spore, that spore is traveling in the air, right? It's traveling over the surface of the earth, sometimes close to the ground, but often not close to the ground. And it's it, it could be true, we thought that it could be true that fungi are releasing spores at certain times to maximize survival and flight. Um, because it's no good as a spore if you travel a very long distance and then reach the ground, but you're dead, right? Clearly you want to um, land on the ground or on the, you know, a sunflower or, you know, an oak tree or whatever you're trying to get to. Um, you want to land while you're still alive. Um, but curiously, this idea of survival in the atmosphere, although people think about it, it hasn't received very much attention in the in the literature. Although not a lot of people, and certainly it, there hasn't been anyone who's connected flight time to survival time and and kind of put that all together. But we 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 thought that this is a way to go um, to think about it this way. So so then we're getting into a question of how of survival, which is complicated, and also how long a spore's journey is. Well, um, that's really complicated because you're talking about a lot, a lot of spores. Um, and when you're talking about modeling something like spores, it's like modeling, you know, it's, it's like um, it's like modeling the the um, particles that make up a cloud. Um, it, it, it's really chaotic to think about. You can't under, You can't look at one spore and and track it and come up with any reasonable conclusion. You have to study lots of spores simultaneously. In other words, you need statistics um, in order to come to any sensible story about um, about spores as a whole. One spore isn't going to tell you the story 
you have to look at lots of spores to understand in general what the big what the big picture is because any individual spores trajectory might be might be quite random and, and chaotic and there's a reason that there's a cloud here and yes a phd is in studying clouds and cloud formation and so she could use um, she could use these principles about how clouds form and, and actually literally translate them and particles are particles at some level, right? So if you study the particles of clouds, you can study spores as particles. It's all the techniques are really analogous. You're just moving to a, a biological journey. So so what, what Agnese um, and our team wanted to do is study the statistics of the flight time of lots and lots and lots of spores. And we decided to study them um, based on their release time at these locations that I obsessed over days and weeks trying to figure out what locations to pick. But we picked, for example, a place in Mexico that's the site of a lot where a lot of corn is grown. Of course, we picked a place in Wisconsin. Um, we picked a place in Canada that's a big wheat growing region. So in this paper, we were, because a lot of the data on the release of spores has to do with plant pathogens, we were thinking about plant pathogens and crops and we were also just trying to cover the territory. And, and here's the critical thing. So, so we we used math to try to, to to model the release of spores. But a critical thing is that NOAA, um, our you know the um, our our U.S. Weather Agency has been collecting data on weather for a very long time, and they make it publicly available. So at these sites, we could go back almost 50 years and pick any day or basically any time we wanted within a few hours in either direction. And we could say this was the real weather at, um, you know, at Madison, Wisconsin on May 20th in 1958. And then we could release, we could model the release of of millions of spores from that site on that day and say how far would they get how far would how far would the spore go um and what we discovered is that there is really a difference as to how far you get um whether you're released at noon for example or midnight so if you're a spore and you're released at noon, you travel for days. And that has everything to do with weather and very specifically turbulence and the movement of wind. Think about it this way. The sun heats up the, the, the air and that air moves. This is something you all intuitively know because you know about thunderstorms, for example. Um, and thunderstorms are like the very definition of moving air and mixing air up. So the air at night is still and the air in the middle of the day is not, I'm making some, some bold statements, but they're not untrue. Um, and so a spore released in the middle of the day will travel very differently than a spore that's released at night. Um, so if you have, if your this X has to do for survival, if your spores can only live for six hours, so think about a clear spore. I'm sure all of you at some point have worked with the fungus and you've gotten a spore print and they're hyaline spores or clear spores. That's a signal to you now that that spore cannot be released in the middle of the day. If it is, it's going to it's going to live a, a very short life and it's going to die while it's still traveling. I'm mixing a lot of species together as I as I tell you this, but the but the biggest thing I want you to get out of this is that we know now that if you release spores in the middle of the day, um, they travel for a long time and therefore they have to be hardy and durable. Spores that are released at night um, uh, don't travel very far at all because the air is not moving. And interestingly enough, tropical mycologists, for example, for a long time have noticed that spores in the tropics are released at night. There's a really funny paper by a guy who said anyone who's a tropical mycologist should become nocturnal because that's when all the interesting things with spores are happening. So I can't say that we've prove that that's why tropical fungi release their spores at night, but it's certainly an intriguing hypothesis. Short-lived spores must travel at night. If you're clear, if you can't survive UV rays, travel at night. But spores that are long-lived can probably be released at any time, right? And so they might evolve to a different, a different set of constraints. They survive most conditions, so they can, they can be released at any time of day. All right, so let me go back to my other, hopefully this won't take as long.
All right, so I, I've told you two dispersal stories now, and I hope, um, I hope that what I've convinced you is that, that in contrast to this idea of millions of spores being shot at random times of day to go randomly anywhere, um, not under control of the fungus, I think that I, 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 I want to change people's worldview on this. I think fungi coordinate and manipulate spore dispersal to a remarkable degree. And we just haven't had enough people telling those stories of how fungi um, move spores around. So here's another story that I'm going to tell you in one slide. Here you're looking at a yeast, but it's a basidiomycete yeast. It's not an ascomycete yeast, so it's not at all related to the yeast that you use, for example, to brew beer or bake bread. And this yeast creates this ballistosporic, ballistic, like a bullet, ballistic spore. And this spore moves across the Petri dish. And if it lands in a place that isn't conducive to the growth of the yeast, it will make another ballistospore and move. So it's not locomotion. I don't know what you call it. But here you've got a situation where yeast can, can as long as it doesn't run out of, of resources, which it may, but it can, it can reproduce and shoot its spore over and over again to crawl or what it move across the, the Petri dish. Again, not sounding very passive to me. And the idea there would be it, it's gonna sporulate until it gets to some habitat that's good for it if it lands in a place that it doesn't like. 